Hi, Chris. Jennifer. <laughs> um, before I start asking you about this piece and about Lika, mm -hmm. I actually just wanted to ask some general, a general question, which is when did you start art writing? I actually don't know when you started the practice of art criticism. And well, kind of exactly as it's told in I Love Dick. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt like the letters were getting repetitive, you know, about my boundless love for him, and I better find something else to talk about in the letters. <laughs> so I made myself go to some art shows, and uh, with the idea that I would write to him about the art shows. Right. So at first it was going to be correspondence. Yeah. And then I mean, at first it was just, you know, okay, like, I want to be entertaining. He's a cultural critic. Why not sort of talk about, you know, your <laughs> surprise? <laughs> Um, teenage, teenage girls magazines tell you that you should kind of, you know, take up the boys' interest <laughs> and learn more about them. So since his interest was art, I thought I would educate myself. Oh, that's so much smarter than the rest of us. I don't think any of us have the good sense to start there. So you had no, I guess it was also kind of a question of, um, you had no grand ideas for criticism when you started writing it in terms of, you know, some people have um, uh, conceptual ideas, theoretical things, and no, it was a seduction not and at, Not at all. Right. Not at all. But, I mean, not to be too disingenuous about it, yeah. I did have some very snobby ideas. I wouldn't say that they were grand ideas, but they were definitely kind of snobby poet ideas, um, you know, and sort of punk rock ideas right. about, like, you know, cutting through the hype about demystification, about saying exactly what you see, mm -hmm. about capturing that the, the phenomenological experience of viewing mm -hmm. is kind of what the writer brings to the text if they're writing about an artwork. Right. You know, there's a huge tradition of poets writing about visual art. And I'd read a lot of writings by poets that I admired writing about artworks. Mm -hmm. And they were so much more interesting to me than conventional art criticism. I mean, I never really knew that. I was always intimidated, you know, like, like civilians to a gallery. I was always very intimidated by looking at contemporary art, thinking, oh, what am I supposed to think about the, right. you know? And like, ah. <laughs> um, when, I, when I started writing about work, I'd never sat down, though. I mean, in a way, it's like every viewer should be forced to write. Mm -hmm about art, mm -hmm. because to write about something is the best way of finding out what you think. You know, and so when I endeavored to write about Eleanor Anton or Katai in the letters, mm -hmm. I found out that, oh, you know, the more you look, the more there is. Right. It's like remembering. The more you remember, the more you remember. So it became this really fascinating experience of looking very deeply mm -hmm. into the work itself. Mm -hmm. and then being interested enough to learn more about it and then looking equally deeply into the context of the work, you know, in relation to other works, into the artist's own, you know, of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that, do you think of yourself, um, do you distinguish the role of art critic like when you when you receive a commission, for example, do you just uh, does your eye change? I mean, as in capital I, subjective I change when you are responsible to, and I put that in quotes, an artist and their work, versus some of the other writing that you do. Well, in a way, not you know? really, because I would never. I mean, I don't take myself seriously as a critic to the extent that I would write about something I didn't like. Right. You know, if I don't like it, I'm just not going to write about it. I'm not going to write a negative piece. Right. So I only, I mean, and I think we all do this too. I mean, it's one of those sort of blessings and curses of the profession is that you have this opportunity to help artists. You know, it's so important for their work to be written about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, often you just do it as a favor, right? Because you believe in their work and you want to support it. And there needs to be this written record of it. Right. So, yeah, writing an essay is just kind of an extension of that. Although... I do have this experience that's very unpleasant, and I'm sure other people have had it too, where you write this thing and you put your heart and soul into it. You think you've done a great job. Mm -hmm. You send it to the artist, and they share it with the gallerist, and it's like, oh, uh, you're off message. Got to change this. Like off brand, you mean? Like, oh, yeah, you misunderstood yeah, yeah. the work. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, it's oh, yeah. not congruent with what they're saying in the press release about the work. So how do you dance 
within that? Because it is tricky. I think everyone's had that moment where an artist is like, oh, you got me completely wrong. And these 5,000 words that you just poured your heart and soul into. Well, I'll never work with that person again. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the end of the relationship completely. Yeah. Um, getting to Lika then, or sort of segueing into face, which I found a quite heartbreaking and, um, well, for many reasons. I actually wanted to start with this. Um, I mean, you often retreat to write. We were talking about this yesterday, and I always find this so interesting. I'm always fascinated by how anyone gets writing done. It seems to me the most impossible thing, and yet here we are <laughs> all doing it. And you remove yourself, go somewhere else. You choose an elsewhere. And, and as you began this story in northern Minnesota, can you talk about why that is for your process, why it is imperative that to go to write, you must go away or you must remove, you know? Well, it's hard to concentrate, you know? I mean, it requires, um, a, it requires a kind of super, super concentration. Right. Um, to really, I mean, to write fiction or even to sort of dive into mm -hmm. the heart of somebody else's work. I mean, it's a, it's a very kind of... Um, intimate and strenuous thing. But you could just get an office somewhere. You don't. You actually like really retreat. It's, well, I did do that. I did do that at one point. You know, I thought I can't keep running away like this. And I went in an office and I wrote a lot of video green in an office. Oh. But at that time I was living alone. I wasn't like, you know, ha having a domestic life with a partner. Mm -hmm. And um, I think so long as I'm having a domestic life with a partner and I need to leave. Right. You know, so I can wake up alone. I can dream about whatever I'm going to write the next day. It's a totally immersive thing so that you're living the work and then it's not so hard because it becomes part of you and you're just transcribing it. I mean, that's not the whole process. You don't have to do that for a year and a half. Right. But just kind of initially to find it. I mean, you, do you do that? Certain, well, I mean... I have an office, and it's never good enough. The solitude is never good enough. But I always think of there's this beautiful story when Jill Johnston goes to visit Agnes Martin, and she writes about this in an essay that the title just fell out of my head. And Martin, of course, had removed herself you know, to live in the desert. And um, she invites Johnston to stay. And about, I think it's two or three days later, says, you have to go. I'm starting to have dreams. I'm starting to have nightmares. In fact, she was just so unable to keep other people's psyches around her, other people's energy around her. And so it absolutely makes sense. I mean, I ask you because I'm also incredibly right. um, well, and jo jealous Johnston that you do kind this. of removed herself with myth. Right. You know, right. she wrote those things as speed jags. Right. She had a very complicated domestic life. And she would, you know, she would go on, on, on a meth jag for right. a couple of days to write these extraordinary pieces. Without punctuation, without stop, without cessation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. she is like such an urtext of art writing, don't right. you think? Oh, God. She, we should do that again. We should, we should have a whole conversation about her at some point. Yes. Um, maybe not now, because I want to keep talking about Faith. Okay. I want to get back to She's such Lika. a huge influence. Well, tell, so when did you, all right, well, we'll just do it. When did you discover Johnson? Was it through the Village Voice? Was it through one of the collections? Or how did she come into your mind? No, it was you around know? the time I was writing I Love Dick. Mm -hmm. And I was researching second wave feminism. And there were Jill Johnston's books. Yeah. And I read her, and it's like, oh, my God, she sounds like Eileen Miles, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just not as if Eileen didn't know that. She had sought out Jill as an influence. And there's this, I mean, we should try and get hold of it. It exists somewhere. There's a recording of a, a city hall conversation that Eileen and Jill Johnston no way. did together. It was at New wow. York Public Library. Oh, wow. And Eileen is doing this beautiful homage to Jill. Mm -hmm. And Jill is just trashing her and totally recanting everything that she did as an art critic. Because by then, she's been in analysis for like right. 20 years. And she totally turned her back on her earlier writing. Right. And began writing memoirs, interestingly enough. But I could not, I, as a reader, I can't. Yeah. The memoirs don't engage me as much as right. that early writing. Has psychoanalysis has like done damage to so many writers. <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I mean, it's done good, too, but, you know. Yeah. No, it, I mean, certainly for her. Although, well, we should talk at some point, because, you know, all of her books are out of print. And why I feel like we'll have an under, another conversation about why I might prod Semiotext to do something about that. But okay. anyway, I took us way off course. Um, 
let's talk about Lika and let's get to this, the, the story that you just wrote, which I think is extraordinary in the ways that it is both um, damning of a certain uh, existence in the art world and uh, revealing uh, of certain things. Uh, we meet Lika essentially at the beginning of your story. Here you are in the middle of nowhere and she comes at you as a wall of art speak you know, these, these dense paragraphs and, and over the course of the story or the document, um, her trauma, her true story is revealed at the very end. And I, I don't even know if there's a question here. I guess I just wanted to unpack that with you, how that all, you know, how that all sort of rolled out in the story. Um, it's very sad. It is. And it's uncomfortable. You know, and my role in it, it's not a very enviable role mm -hmm. because clearly she's kind of, um, she's defining me as an authority figure, mm -hmm. right, who needs to be challenged. Um, you know, I'm kind of, I, I'm the stand-in for authority mm -hmm. that she's confronting. And so I saw this, but it would be kind of awful not to accept. Right. You know, because she wasn't wrong. I had been granted by that point a certain amount of authority in the art world, and to pretend otherwise would be disingenuous. So, okay, I will play that distasteful role. I'll be Pierre Ubu, you know, and step into it, and you can ridicule me. Um, fine. But in the course of that, this other thing comes out mm -hmm. that was like so necessary for her, mm -hmm. um, which has a lot to do with marginality you know you think that all kind of difference in marginality has been completely erased mm -hmm. from the international art world but no i mean here's someone who was a child in romania still during the kosciuszko years and who lived in terrible poverty as a european emigre you know there are these other stories that come into it right. that don't surface so easily but they're still there you know? and, and it's almost as though she uses, I mean, the, it's interesting how she's using the art object or the idea of the art object. So the cigarette butt from Caspar Koenig and the, and, the, and the Christmas trees. At first, I, you know, as you're reading or as I was reading this story, so at first I'm like, oh, she's going to send up conceptual art. Well, all right, whatever. And then these things become divining rods in a different way and sort of touchstones for this horror that almost can't be spoken about or that she has been unable to deal with, or perhaps I'm making it too heavy. I just thought it was very interesting that where the art, where art and art speak can sometimes feel as though it's obfuscating meaning and story, suddenly it flipped. Or perhaps that was just in the transaction with yeah. you that it was able to do well, that. Well, she was a curator. She had right. changed as a curator and not an artist. Right. So to kind of you know defect from curation and make an artwork you know, that was kind of a big move. That was already a kind of big critical move. Yeah, that move, was a big move. A sharp elbow. Um, I think this brings me to, and I don't have a sharp question around that, but maybe it'll seed something for when we, when we start to talk as a group. It does bring up this, this idea of the critic as citizen, as global citizen. I mean, you, do, you talk about um, the sort of, uh, the brilliant young curators that you describe who are wandering around globally um, with effortless grace in a productive state of permanent transience, which I loved. And then I wonder where, where does the critic belong? Where does the writer belong in this sort of permanent state of transience? Or what is the role, rather, of the critic? Um, I wondered if you can, it's not a sharp question, as I said, but it's kind of this interesting thing of how do we document, record, speak back to? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, is the question, what is the role of the critic in that? <laughs> I guess so. I guess that's the simplest way, but, but that the art world, well, we were talking earlier about you know, this, um, the difference between when the art world used to be tight communities in certain cities Mm -hmm. And now it's gone global for better or for worse. Right. Therefore, more generic for better and for worse. That's, this gets to the wall of Lika's art speak being both impenetrable, um, because as you say, it was so full of content, it sort of led into this void. Um, and then where is our job as writers to um, play within that, speak back to it? Yes, I guess it is what is the role of the critic. Well, I mean, so ideally changing. to bring something to it. I mean, there, there's... Uh, 
there's two strategies, right? Mm -hmm. If you're within the bubble, um, hopefully you can bring something to it that is genuine and immediate. Mm -hmm. um, the first person I thought of like that is Quinn Latimer. Oh, yeah. You know, she's a wonderful writer. Um, she's a poet, primarily. Mm -hmm. um, and she writes about art in a very literary way that's quite unusual. I, th I think it was kind of, you know how the, the fashion changed for a while to sort of poetic press releases? Right. And I think that was Quinn Latimer's <laughs> influence. <laughs> Um, Maria Fusco, also sadly, who's mm. going to be here and who's not, her writing uh, is so incredibly literary. Mm. Um, and Lynn Tillman, another person. All of these people are writing about work that has a centrality within that bubble, and yet they're writing about it in a very direct and felt mm -hmm. and intelligent way mm -hmm. that connects it to things outside the bubble. And then the other strategy is to look outside the bubble for things to write about, i.e. Like Kelly Lake's store. Yeah. <laughs> Can we talk about this book? I mean, you didn't read from it today, but it's very much related. I mean, you said as much when you were um, talking about face, introducing face. What, if not in this, sort of generally what propels you to the margins or what what was it that you were seeking outside the art world? I mean, I think I know the answer, but I want to hear you say it. <laughs> um, what was I, sorry. Oh, sorry, what were you seeking? When you go outside the sanctioned art world, right? The, the sort of the people uh -huh. we think have been uh, anointed and knighted. When you go, say, to Mexicali, or, or, or you go um, into these odd spaces, what is it that you're looking for, or what is it? Well, I mean, I, I mean, to be honest, I guess I'm not looking for anything. I'm just kind of like stumbling around through my life like we all are. And then you just chance upon this amazing thing. Right. And you get curious about it. I mean, that's what happened to me in Mexicali. Mm -hmm. You know, I got, I got a Warhol Foundation grant to write about tiny creatures. And it was like the first time I've been like funded just to write an essay to right. that degree. So I'm like, okay, I'm really going to do this. It's going to be a total investigative work. And they'd shown for three days in Mexicali. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll go down to Mexicali so I can write about, write about where they showed. Right. Um, at this, you know, they did a pop-up show at Mexicali Rose. But in the course of doing that like research, I went to Mexicali and I met these people and they were amazing. There was an opening that weekend that was more like a block party. And they had such deep connections to the Puerto Nueva community. Mm -hmm. And yet they'd been to art school. And it wasn't exactly outsider art. They knew right. what the discourse was in the rest of the art world. I mean, it was like contemporary art, but with a more lower middle class street art twist. And I found that really fascinating. Right. And I liked the people very much. They had an incredible work ethic and seriousness about what they were doing. So I kept going back, you know. And I got to write about one of the shows for Art Forum. And then eventually, I organized an exhibition of their work at Artist Space, mm -hmm. where Richard Burkett and I and Marco Vera, the curator there, we basically moved Mexicali Rose to, to Artist Space in New York. Right. What was it like to see it there? I mean, taken totally out of context. Oh, it was just beautiful. It was beautiful. I mean, it was so well done. It was so well done. I mean, Richard had a great sensitivity to making sure that it didn't look too anomalous or too patronizing, as if art, spouse, art space was kind of patronizing this outsider thing. Right. It was advancing a new kind of insiderness. How so? I mean, advancing a new uh, insiderness, meaning just a sort of inclusivity? Is that what, what you mean by that? A new, by advancing a new kind of insiderness? Mm -hmm. Well, for example, they included um, uh, the work of a journalist, Sergio Haro. Mm -hmm. um, he was the Mexicali editor for Zeta. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's an incredibly admirable and courageous newsweekly in Mexico that's done fearless coverage of the cartel wars. Um, the masthead is full of black crosses of assassinated journalists. Oh. And Sergio Haro is a truly remarkable and inspiring person. Well, because Mexicali is a small place, the people at Mexicali Rose they knew Sergio, and Sergio was supportive of their work. And so there was an exhibition of Sergio's work as part of the show, and he came to New York and, and was part of it. So it was like 
instead of paying lip service to this kind of incredibly meaningless word community, mm -hmm. it was like a real community had been imported from Mexicali into the gallery in New York. Amazing. What now? Um, just as we're going to segue into questions, I wonder. Just one last question: What are you? What do you have your eye on now, or who? What are you working on now? Can I ask? Um, or if you'd rather not say. No, I have to write. I mean, I have to write, and, and often like really good work starts out with I have to write. <laughs> you know, like you don't want to do it. You don't want to do yeah. it. You and then it's no longer a choice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, then you get around to doing it, and you find that it's really fascinating. Right. And there's a lot to say. So I'm, I'm a, I have to write something about an artist in New Zealand, Ta Wells, oh. who I've been in touch with for a long time. He calls himself a, uh, a community conceptual artist or a conceptual community artist. What does that mean? I'm, fa I'm so interested. Oh, he does these projects that he gets incredibly vilified for in New Zealand. Like he did something about the benefit mm -hmm. um, of unemployment. Mm -hmm. uh, he was collecting unemployment like a lot of artists do in New Zealand. Um, and he did an art project about how everybody should be on the benefit, you know. <laughs> Encouraging people uh, so, to go so, on the I goal. mean, they're so literal in New Zealand. They're so <laughs> earnest. I mean, they're kind of like Canadian squared. <laughs> so, I mean, to see the social welfare system, you know. Um, sort of strung out as something we could. Uh, yes, as yes, a yes. I mean, it just drove them everyone. crazy. <laughs> Um, so this was a hugely controversial project, and I'm going to write about that. That sounds amazing. Um, sh we should open it up to questions now, I think. Yes? Oh, I think there's a microphone coming around. It's Jane again. Uh, you mentioned Canada before I did. Because my question has to do with um, what has been your experience in terms of the art world in Canada or art writing. Uh, you can you, you've been all over the world. So, has in what way has Canada and its uh, art uh, production seeped into your consciousness? Um, my experience in Canada and what people have crept into my consciousness. Or their art, or their writing. Uh, and at, uh, how has Canada, Canadian writers, Canadian art sort of seeded itself into your consciousness? What do you know about it? What, what is your experience? Oh, a lot. A lot. Um, I spent time at the Western Front a few times. And the last time, I was invited by Jesse Birch, and I stayed for, I don't know, more than a week. Um, and that was really amazing, um, that trip. That was very, that, that made a big impression on me um, because of the way they kind of worked it out, the, two, the generations of artists. And then I realized that they weren't the only ones in Canada, that there were some kind of historic spaces in Canada like Western Front and others that had been started in the 60s and 70s. And in the case of Western Front, it wasn't just an art space, but it was where they lived. It was their apartments, the founders. And they had worked it out so beautifully. Um, the founders kind of ceded control at a certain point and realized it needed to be run by another generation, that younger people needed to bring their vision into the space. Um, but at the same time, they kept their apartments, you know. And Vancouver is impossibly expensive. It was New York. The the you know the new generation would be just kind of breathing down their necks, waiting for them to go into an old age home or die and get their apartments. But they worked it out in such a good way. The coexistence of the two generations. And then I saw that that had happened in in other places and others. There was another space similar in the same city in Vancouver. And, um, and being at Plug-In this summer and seeing the work of some of the people there and also the history of that space, um, there's just this very great longevity that I think in the US, semiotext is the only institution, quote unquote, that I think of that has that longevity. And it could be because we're not entirely American. You know, Sylvain's French, Huddy's Moroccan French, and I'm sort of half a New Zealander. Um, enterprises that can remain open and fluid and undefined enough to 
allow for the change that allows for longevity. You know, in the US, people have so much ego involved that it's almost necessarily there could be only one incarnation and then it's over. You know, the door can't be open enough, wide enough, for long enough for it to change and mutate. So yeah, that's a part of Canadian art that's been really important. And then the work of Daphne Marlotte and Gail Scott, Canadian writers whose work I've gotten to know, Eldon Garnett, I've known him for years, Hank Ball, really important. Thanks so much for the discussion and for the uh, reading. Uh, my question is about <clears throat> the way that you highlighted phenomenology and uh, its relationship to art writing. And I was thinking about how a writer or a visitor to an exhibition can set the stage for a phenomenological encounter, you know, like Walter Benjamin's use of substances, uh, just as one example. And I was wondering if you have any techniques for setting the phenomenological stage for yourself or advice for others. It doesn't have to involve substances. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, so, I'm sorry, that was so amplified. I couldn't hear it properly. Could you? Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I'm talking about uh, phenomenology. And um, uh, he uses Walter Benjamin. Benjamin is an example of uh, approaching the artwork. How do you set the stage? This is what you wanted to know. How do you set the stage for looking and for encounters with art? And do you have? Um, uh, do you have advice uh, along those lines too? And what's the last part? And do you have advice along the lines? Oh no! <laughs> Gosh, I don't have advice at all. But it's such a good question, <laughs> and it's so important. Um, I know that when I, you know, one trick that I've developed is um, when I teach writing, especially art writing, like in an MFA program setting, um, I insist that everybody keep a diary. For the duration, and that's harder and harder. I mean, the more kind of connected everybody is 24 7, the harder it is and the more artificial it feels for people to kind of like get offline for long enough to write in a notebook. Um, but when we're able to do it, it's incredibly useful because of the, once you start to do it, there's naturally kind of a flow between subjective, you know, quote unquote, subjective and objective. You know, you'll be writing about your problems and your feelings in your day, but then you'll also be writing about your thoughts. You know, or, you know, especially if you're at art school, you're thinking a lot about art and seeing a lot of art. So it's kind of reaching for that sweet spot where, you know, you're talking about, like, you know, who was at dinner last night and what they said and what you thought about the work that you saw last week. And it all kind of blends together. And, you know, in a way that kind of replicates what you're talking about, like, what, you know, Walter Benjamin's beautiful way of looking at things that was so incredibly enmeshed with other things that he was looking at, you know, as such a panoramic vision. Um, the Moscow Diary, isn't that, and I just read that kind of recently. Have you read that, The Moscow Diary of Walter Benjamin? That's such an amazing text. It's, it's about his unrequited love. I mean, he goes there basically to have an affair with the wife of a friend. You know, it's all kind of consensual among the three of them, but it kind of takes a wrong turn, and he doesn't really get to see the woman as much as he'd hoped. So it's a story about heartbreak, but it's also like, a, you know, he's also writing all this, he's writing all this criticism to pay for the trip. Um, <laughs> And so it also becomes like a story about, you know, early Soviet Russia, you know, and what the streets look like and what people do and the artwork that he was seeing there. Any last questions? Thank you both. Um, wonderful to hear you speak. Um, I'd just like to uh, expand on the um, point you made earlier, Chris, and also Jen, who you spoke about it a little bit as well, about distance and about proximity, you know, first to one's own writing. But I'd just like to ask, you know, in terms of your engagement with the Romanian uh, curator, obviously, and, sorry. Can you just mic this, please? <coughs> um, 
sorry for that. My question is regarding proximity. You mentioned earlier that there's a degree of distance that's required for your own writing. And also, uh, Jennifer, you had mentioned about kind of global citizens as well and how, um, you know, what role that plays as well. So in terms of geography, to, in terms of like both conceptual and physical proximity. I, I just want to know a little bit more because, um, you know, I'm an art historian by my academia, so it was natural that I would go into art writing and take a profession off as a curator. It was almost, you know, a given in some ways, but I did study literature in undergraduate. But in terms of having, you know, having that proximity, not coming from an art historical background and then writing another layer, writing about an artist who happens to come from a former CIS country where she had undergone very different uh, experiences too. Where do you, you know, how does your own subjectivity, it's obviously um, somebody who's grown up in New Zealand and lived in the US, how do you bridge that, you know, to accurately speak about the work? You know, that's something, a question, it, it kind of rolls into agency as well know, who speaks and for whom as well. So I'd like to uh, hear your view on that. You, so um, it's a very long question. How do I, how, what would, how should I best sort of? Well, I'm interested in, um, obviously as, as writers, that global citizen question about uh, proximities and, uh, and not having that subjective experience and how to write about that in a question of agency. Okay, questions of agency and subjectivity as writers within a sort of global, um, you know, in the sort of the, in the global art world, we could say. Um, and a question of proximity and subjectivity, how does one speak for others? Um, yes? Well, you, yes, I think you can't speak for others. You can speak about others, but you can only speak as yourself speaking about others. That's, no, that's uh, the question, but then writing about something, even putting a layer of subjectivity onto something that might not necessarily have the experience of, how do you bridge that? Oh, to bridge a lack, uh, um, how do you as a writer bridge a sort of lack of personal experience with the story that you're writing? Um, and you mean sort of? In terms of art writing, um, you know? In terms of art writing. In terms I of quote them, I quote the person a lot. You know, I always talk to people when I'm writing about their work. Even a review, if it's possible, I try and talk to the artist. I mean, for one thing, the quote kind of fills, it fills up space and you don't have to write as much. <laughs> but <laughs> um, for another thing, you start to ventriloquize them in a way. And I mean, I feel this. Whenever I read long essays about art, I feel like I'm always ventriloquizing the people that I've talked to. I mean, in this case, it was the woman that I referred to as Lika. Um, so no, I mean, I could never know what it was like to leave Romania under those conditions and to live in Sweden where your mother's working as a janitor and she used to be a theater director. Um, but I could use the essay to give her the space to speak about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for reading. And thank you so much, Jennifer, for the conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you, Chris, about what you said regarding you only write about art that you like. Um, I'm curious in general about what you think that means for criticism and the direction that criticism is going in. Uh, I think in the United States, where I come from, I'm finding that criticism more and more is very complementary as opposed to critical. Um, and just curious what you think about that. I feel like the piece that you read from shows something where you're sort of starting out in a humorous sort of criticism that turns into something more complementary or deeper. Um, but yeah, more just about the direction that you think criticism is moving in and, and what it means. OK, writing about work that I like. Right, writing about work that you like. Within the, within the say, I, I'll, I'll translate, um, within the, say, uh, problem of contemporary criticism being perhaps only complementary, uh, particularly in the United States, and what does this mean for the direction of criticism if if, if you only write about what you like and n never about what you don't like, can you talk about? That's a really good question. Um, and I don't have a good answer either. I mean, in a way, my answer, if I'm going to be honest, it would be that on a certain level, I don't care enough about the art world to enter into like a life and death <laughs> battle over its stakes. Um, I would feel move. I would feel more moved to do that um, about writing, 
and within the literary world, but at the same time, the punishment is so great for doing it in the literary world, you really have to pick your battles. Um, I think what you're talking about, though, is largely a consequence of the fact that there are so few professional critics anymore, you know, and that as artists or writers who are drafted to write about the work of other artists and writers, and there's not really kind of a class of professional critics that barely exists. And of course, you know, within the lens of criticism, you're not only going to, you're not just going to write about it's your work, and you're going to write about all things that you like, that you don't like. You know, you you have a much bigger picture in mind. It's you know that is your work. That's your mandate to make sense of the culture, and that means being unsparing, in a way that you can't really expect one artist to be of another. You know, for like zero reward, except for the spectacle of like some kind of nasty personal cat fight. You know. Um, it's not, it's just not set up that way, you know, and then somebody like Dale Peck kind of very consciously sets themselves up as the nasty critic, the negative critic, and he becomes famous for being like, you know, the no holds barred negative critic. Um, it's a very strange dilemma and one that really bears thought. Jennifer. Oh, yes. Um, in your program. Would you say that the people who come out of your program, even if they entered it as producing artists or producing writers, mm -hmm. do they see themselves more professionally as critics by the end of the program? Absolutely. I mean, the ones who choose. So I am. Um, oh, should I do? I, I teach in an MFA art writing program uh, at the School of Visual Arts in New York, chaired by David Levi Strauss. And it's. I think we are one of maybe two programs like this in the US. Um, it is, it's a really interesting question. When students leave, they at least leave with the choice of what kind of writer and critic to be. Some go on to get PhDs, uh, some go on to um, you know, become curators and so forth, but the ones who leave deciding to be critics take that job very seriously, I'm proud to say. Um, whether or not they're given the opportunity to actually exercise yeah. their muscles that way, um, negative, positive reviews or responses, sort of responsible responses, that's a whole other question as to what venues allow that kind of, that kind of text, you know, that kind of thinking anymore, so. Yes. Um, it's a very different ethos in the present, say, than it was in, well, for example, the mid-20th century. I did some research about Mary McCarthy earlier this wow. year. And so I went back and I read Mary McCarthy's criticism, which was vile. It was scathing. It was just, I mean, the she. Her criticism or the literary criticism or what were you her, reading? Her, the, her theater criticism. It's literary criticism as well. It was so harsh, you know. And then you read what other people wrote about her, you know, her friends, what her like supposed friends wrote about the group. I mean, people just had at each other in a way that we would never consider doing today. Part of that is, uh, I guess we can't know, but is part of that because the community, the community such as it was, or the literary circles such as they were back in the day, um, that was just part of the job. But also, it was a small enough group that you know you knew you'd get your comeuppance, and it, like what would go around would come around, or something like that. I mean, McCarthy is a brilliant example of just venom unleashed, and yet she's not wrong. That's the scary yeah, thing. She's brilliant. She's She's brilliant. I think we should do a play. Yes. About them. Right now. Well, <laughs> at some later point, like you know, we as contemporary people make a play where we put them all as characters, kind of like tearing at each other, so we can see what that looks like because it's so alien to us. It's completely. It's so. It's so beyond alien. And and also that. They wanted to read it. They wanted, they wanted this feedback. They wanted critical feedback. And maybe that's something that gets returned to uh, yeah. throughout the weekend. But I think we're up. Time's up. Oh, you're all being very polite about it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you so much. So much. It's so great to have you here with us today, both Chris and Jennifer. A beautiful exchange.
We'll be taking a coffee break for 15 minutes, and while we're having coffee, I'd like to start thinking about how this void of criticism informs institutional practice, because it's a real challenge for us working in institutions to literally be working in a critical void. So let's think about that as well as we're working through the weekend. Our coffee's out there, and we'll come back sharply at um, 20 after 11. Thank you. <laughs>